Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Darling by Anton P. Chekhov Olenka, the daughter of the retired collegiate assessor Plemianikov, was sitting on the back door steps of her house doing nothing. It was hot, the flies were nagging and teasing, and it was pleasant to think that it would soon be evening. Dark rain clouds were gathering from the east, wafting a breath of moisture every now and then. Kukin, who roomed in the wing of the same house, was standing in the yard looking up at the sky. He was the manager of the Tivoli, an open-air theater. Again, he said despairingly. Rain again. Rain, rain, rain. Every day rain. As though to spite me. I might as well stick my head into a noose and be done with it. It's ruining me. Heavy losses every day. He wrung his hands, and continued, addressing Olenka, what a life, Olga Semyonovna. It's enough to make a man weep. He works, he does his best, his very best, he tortures himself, he passes sleepless nights, he thinks and thinks and thinks how to do everything just right. And what's the result? He gives the public the best operetta, the very best pantomime, excellent artists. But do they want it? Have they the least appreciation of it? The public is rude. The public is a great bore. The public wants a circus, a lot of nonsense, a lot of stuff. And there's the weather. Look. Rain almost every evening. It began to rain on the 10th of May, and it's kept it up through the whole of June. It's simply awful. I can't get any audiences, and don't I have to pay rent? Don't I have to pay the actors? The next day towards evening the clouds gathered again, and Cookin said with an hysterical laugh, Oh, I don't care. Let it do its worst. Let it drown the whole theater, and me, too. All right, no luck for me in this world or the next. Let the actors bring suit against me and drag me to court. What's the court? Why not Siberia at hard labor, or even the scaffold? Ha, ha, ha. It was the same on the third day. Olenka listened to Kukin seriously, in silence. Sometimes tears would rise to her eyes. At last Kukin's misfortune touched her. She fell in love with him. He was short, gaunt, with a yellow face, and curly hair combed back from his forehead, and a thin tenor voice. His features puckered all up when he spoke. Despair was ever inscribed on his face. And yet he awakened in Olenka a sincere, deep feeling. She was always loving somebody. She couldn't get on without loving somebody. She had loved her sick father, who sat the whole time in his armchair in a darkened room, breathing heavily. She had loved her aunt, who came from Bryanska once or twice a year to visit them. And before that, when a pupil at the progymnasium, she had loved her French teacher. She was a quiet, kind-hearted, compassionate girl, with a soft gentle way about her. And she made a very healthy, wholesome impression. Looking at her full, rosy cheeks, at her soft white neck with the black mole, and at the good naive smile that always played on her face when something pleasant was said, the men would think, not so bad, and would smile too, and the lady visitors, in the middle of the conversation, would suddenly grasp her hand and exclaim, you darling, in a burst of delight. The house, hers by inheritance, in which she had lived from birth, was located at the outskirts of the city on the Gypsy Road, not far from the Tivoli. From early evening till late at night she could hear the music in the theater and the bursting of the rockets, and it seemed to her that Kukin was roaring and battling with his fate and taking his chief enemy, the indifferent public, by assault. Her heart melted softly, she felt no desire to sleep, and when Kukin returned home towards morning, she tapped on her window pane, and through the curtains he saw her face and one shoulder and the kind smile she gave him. He proposed to her, and they were married. 
and when he had a good look of her neck and her full vigorous shoulders, he clapped his hands and said, You darling. He was happy. But it rained on their wedding day, and the expression of despair never left his face. They got along well together. She sat in the cashier's box, kept the theater in order, wrote down the expenses, and paid out the salaries. Her rosy cheeks, her kind naive smile, like a halo around her face, could be seen at the cashier's window, behind the scenes, and in the café. She began to tell her friends that the theater was the greatest, the most important, the most essential thing in the world, that it was the only place to obtain true enjoyment in and become humanized and educated. But do you suppose the public appreciates it? she asked. What the public wants is the circus. Yesterday Vanichka and I gave underscore Faust burlesque underscore, and almost all the boxes were empty. If we had given some silly nonsense, I assure you, the theater would have been overcrowded. Tomorrow we'll put underscore Orpheus in Hades underscore on. Do come. Whatever Cookin said about the theater and the actors, she repeated. She spoke, as he did, with contempt of the public, of its indifference to art, of its boorishness. She meddled in the rehearsals, corrected the actors, watched the conduct of the musicians, and when an unfavorable criticism appeared in the local paper, she wept and went to the editor to argue with him. The actors were fond of her and called her Vanichka and I, and the darling. She was sorry for them and lent them small sums. When they bilked her, she never complained to her husband, at the utmost she shed a few tears. In winter, too, they got along nicely together. They leased a theater in the town for the whole winter and sublet it for short periods to a little Russian theatrical company, to a conjurer and to the local amateur players. Olenka grew fuller and was always beaming with contentment, while Kukin grew thinner and yellower and complained of his terrible losses, though he did fairly well the whole winter. At night he coughed, and she gave him raspberry syrup and lime water, rubbed him with eau de cologne, and wrapped him up in soft coverings. You are my precious sweet, she said with perfect sincerity, stroking his hair. You are such a dear. At Lent he went to Moscow to get his company together, and, while without him, Olenka was unable to sleep. She sat at the window the whole time, gazing at the stars. She likened herself to the hens that are also uneasy and unable to sleep when their rooster is out of the coop. Kukin was detained in Moscow. He wrote he would be back during Easter week, and in his letters discussed arrangements already for the Tivoli. But late one night, before Easter Monday, there was an ill-omened knocking at the wicket gate. It was like a knocking on a barrel boom, boom, boom. The sleepy cook ran barefooted, plashing through the puddles, to open the gate. Open the gate, please, said someone in a hollow bass voice. I have a telegram for you. Olenka had received telegrams from her husband before, but this time, somehow, she was numbed with terror. She opened the telegram with trembling hands and read, Ivan Petrovich died suddenly today. Awaiting propped orders for Wunerl Tuesday. That was the way the telegram was written, Wunerl, and another unintelligible word, propped. The telegram was signed by the manager of the opera company. My dearest. Olenka burst out sobbing. Vanichka, my dearest, my sweetheart. Why did I ever meet you? Why did I ever get to know you and love you? To whom have you abandoned your poor Olenka, your poor, unhappy Olenka? Kukin was buried on Tuesday in the Vagenkov Cemetery in Moscow. Olenka returned home on Wednesday, and as soon as she entered her house she threw herself on her bed and broke into such loud sobbing that she could be heard in the street and in the neighboring yards. The darling, said the neighbors, crossing themselves. How Olga Semyonovna, the poor darling, is grieving. Three months afterwards Olenka was returning home from mass, downhearted and in deep mourning. Beside her walked a man also returning from church, Vasily Pustovalov, the manager of the merchant Babakayev's lumber yard. He was wearing a straw hat, a white vest with a gold chain, and looked more like a landowner than a businessman.
Everything has its ordained course, Olga Semyonovna, he said sedately, with sympathy in his voice. And if any one near and dear to us dies, then it means it was God's will and we should remember that and bear it with submission. He took her to the wicket gate, said goodbye and went away. After that she heard his sedate voice the whole day, and on closing her eyes she instantly had a vision of his dark beard. She took a great liking to him. And evidently he had been impressed by her, too, for, not long after, an elderly woman, a distant acquaintance, came in to have a cup of coffee with her. As soon as the woman was seated at table she began to speak about Pustovalov how good he was, what a steady man, and any woman could be glad to get him as a husband. Three days later Pustovalov himself paid Olenka a visit. He stayed only about ten minutes, and spoke little, but Olenka fell in love with him, fell in love so desperately that she did not sleep the whole night and burned as with fever. In the morning she sent for the elderly woman. Soon after, Olenka and Pustovalov were engaged, and the wedding followed. Pustovalov and Olenka lived happily together. He usually stayed in the lumberyard until dinner, then went out on business. In his absence Olenka took his place in the office until evening, attending to the bookkeeping and dispatching the orders. Lumber rises 20% every year nowadays, she told her customers and acquaintances. Imagine, we used to buy wood from our forests here. Now Vasichka has to go every year to the government of Mogilev to get wood. And what a tax, she exclaimed, covering her cheeks with her hands in terror. What a tax! She felt as if she had been dealing in lumber for ever so long, that the most important and essential thing in life was lumber. There was something touching and endearing in the way she pronounced the words, beam, joist, plank, stave, lath, gun carriage, clamp. At night she dreamed of whole mountains of boards and planks, long, endless rows of wagons conveying the wood somewhere, far, far from the city. She dreamed that a whole regiment of beams, 36 feet x 5 inches, were advancing in an upright position to do battle against the lumberyard, that the beams and joists and clamps were knocking against each other, emitting the sharp crackling reports of dry wood, that they were all falling and then rising again, piling on top of each other. Olenka cried out in her sleep, and Pustovalov said to her gently, Olenka my dear, what is the matter? Cross yourself. Her husband's opinions were all hers. If he thought the room was too hot, she thought so too. If he thought business was dull, she thought business was dull. Pustovalov was not fond of amusements and stayed home on holidays, she did the same. You are always either at home or in the office, said her friends. Why don't you go to the theater or to the circus, darling? Vasichka and I never go to the theater, she answered sedately. We have work to do, we have no time for nonsense. What does one get out of going to theater? On Saturdays she and Pustovalov went to Vespers, and on holidays to early mass. On returning home they walked side by side with rapt faces, an agreeable smell emanating from both of them and her silk dress rustling pleasantly. At home they drank tea with milk bread and various jams, and then ate pie. Every day at noontime there was an appetizing odor in the yard and outside the gate of cabbage soup, roast mutton, or duck, and, on fast days, of fish. You couldn't pass the gate without being seized by an acute desire to eat. The samovar was always boiling on the office table, and customers were treated to tea and biscuits. Once a week the married couple went to the baths and returned with red faces, walking side by side. We are getting along very well, thank God, said Olenka to her friends. God grant that all should live as well as Vasichka and I. When Pustovalov went to the government of Mogilev to buy wood, she was dreadfully homesick for him, did not sleep nights, and cried. Sometimes the veterinary surgeon of the regiment, Smirnov, a young man who lodged in the wing of her house, came to see her evenings. He related incidents, or they played cards together. This distracted her. The most interesting of his stories were those of his own life. 
He was married and had a son, but he had separated from his wife because she had deceived him, and now he hated her and sent her forty rubles a month for his son's support. Olenka sighed, shook her head, and was sorry for him. Well, the Lord keep you, she said, as she saw him off to the door by candlelight. Thank you for coming to kill time with me. May God give you health. Mother in heaven. She spoke very sedately, very judiciously, imitating her husband. The veterinary surgeon had disappeared behind the door when she called out after him, Do you know, Vladimir Platnik, you ought to make up with your wife. Forgive her, if only for the sake of your son. The child understands everything, you may be sure. When Pustovalov returned, she told him in a low voice about the veterinary surgeon and his unhappy family life, and they sighed and shook their heads, and talked about the boy who must be homesick for his father. Then, by a strange association of ideas, they both stopped before the sacred images, made genuflections, and prayed to God to send them children. And so the Pustovalovs lived for full six years, quietly and peaceably, in perfect love and harmony. But once in the winter Vasily Andreich, after drinking some hot tea, went out into the lumberyard without a hat on his head, caught a cold and took sick. He was treated by the best physicians, but the malady progressed, and he died after an illness of four months. Olenka was again left a widow. To whom have you left me, my darling? she wailed after the funeral. How shall I live now without you, wretched creature that I am? Pity me, good people, pity me, fatherless and motherless, all alone in the world. She went about dressed in black and weepers, and she gave up wearing hats and gloves for good. She hardly left the house except to go to church and to visit her husband's grave. She almost led the life of a nun. It was not until six months had passed that she took off the weepers and opened her shutters. She began to go out occasionally in the morning to market with her cook. But how she lived at home and what went on there, could only be surmised. It could be surmised from the fact that she was seen in her little garden drinking tea with the veterinarian while he read the paper out loud to her, and also from the fact that once on meeting an acquaintance at the post office, she said to her, there is no proper veterinary inspection in our town. That is why there is so much disease. You constantly hear of people getting sick from the milk and becoming infected by the horses and cows. The health of domestic animals ought really to be looked after as much as that of human beings. She repeated the veterinarian's words and held the same opinions as he about everything. It was plain that she could not exist a single year without an attachment, and she found her new happiness in the wing of her house. In anyone else this would have been condemned, but no one could think ill of Olenka. Everything in her life was so transparent. She and the veterinary surgeon never spoke about the change in their relations. They tried, in fact, to conceal it, but unsuccessfully, for Olenka could have no secrets. When the surgeon's colleagues from the regiment came to see him, she poured tea, and served the supper, and talked to them about the cattle plague, the foot and mouth disease, and the municipal slaughterhouses. The surgeon was dreadfully embarrassed, and after the visitors had left, he caught her hand and hissed angrily, didn't I ask you not to talk about what you don't understand? When we doctors discuss things, please don't mix in. It's getting to be a nuisance. She looked at him in astonishment and alarm, and asked, but, Valadika, what underscore am underscore I to talk about? And she threw her arms round his neck, with tears in her eyes, and begged him not to be angry. And they were both happy. But their happiness was of short duration. The veterinary surgeon went away with his regiment to be gone for good, when it was transferred to some distant place almost as far as Siberia, and Olenka was left alone. Now she was completely alone. Her father had long been dead, and his armchair lay in the attic covered with dust and minus one leg. She got thin and homely, and the people who met her on the street no longer looked at her as they had used to, nor smiled at her. Evidently her best years were over, past and gone, and a new, 
dubious life was to begin which it were better not to think about. In the evening Olenka sat on the steps and heard the music playing and the rockets bursting in the Tivoli, but it no longer aroused any response in her. She looked listlessly into the yard, thought of nothing, wanted nothing, and when night came on, she went to bed and dreamed of nothing but the empty yard. She ate and drank as though by compulsion. And what was worst of all, she no longer held any opinions. She saw and understood everything that went on around her, but she could not form an opinion about it. She knew of nothing to talk about. And how dreadful not to have opinions. For instance, you see a bottle, or you see that it is raining, or you see a mujik riding by in a wagon. But what the bottle or the rain or the mujik are for, or what the sense of them all is, you cannot tell you cannot tell, not for a thousand rubles. In the days of Kukin and Pustovalov and then of the veterinary surgeon, Olenka had had an explanation for everything, and would have given her opinion freely no matter about what. But now there was the same emptiness in her heart and brain as in her yard. It was as galling and bitter as a taste of wormwood. Gradually the town grew up all around. The gypsy road had become a street, and where the Tivoli and the lumber yard had been, there were now houses and a row of side streets. How quickly time flies! Olenka's house turned gloomy, the roof rusty, the shed slanting. Dock and thistles overgrew the yard. Olenka herself had aged and grown homely. In the summer she sat on the steps, and her soul was empty and dreary and bitter. When she caught the breath of spring, or when the wind wafted the chime of the cathedral bells, a sudden flood of memories would pour over her, her heart would expand with a tender warmth, and the tears would stream down her cheeks. But that lasted only a moment. Then would come emptiness again, and the feeling, what is the use of living? The black kitten Briska rubbed up against her and purred softly, but the little creature's caresses left Olenka untouched. That was not what she needed. What she needed was a love that would absorb her whole being, her reason, her whole soul, that would give her ideas, an object in life, that would warm her aging blood. And she shook the black kitten off her skirt angrily, saying, Go away. What are you doing here? And so day after day, year after year not a single joy, not a single opinion. Whatever Marva, the cook, said was all right. One hot day in July, towards evening, as the town cattle were being driven by, and the whole yard was filled with clouds of dust, there was suddenly a knocking at the gate. Olenka herself went to open it, and was dumbfounded to behold the veterinarian Smirnov. He had turned grey and was dressed as a civilian. All the old memories flooded into her soul, she could not restrain herself, she burst out crying, and laid her head on Smirnov's breast without saying a word. So overcome was she that she was totally unconscious of how they walked into the house and seated themselves to drink tea. My darling, she murmured, trembling with joy. Vladimir Platnik, from where has God sent you? I want to settle here for good, he told her. I have resigned my position and have come here to try my fortune as a free man and lead a settled life. Besides, it's time to send my boy to the gymnasium. He is grown up now. You know, my wife and I have become reconciled. Where is she? asked Olenka. At the hotel with the boy. I am looking for lodgings. Good gracious, bless you, take my house. Why won't my house do? Oh, dear. Why, I won't ask any rent of you, Olenka burst out in the greatest excitement, and began to cry again. You live here and the wing will be enough for me. Oh, heavens, what a joy! The very next day the roof was being painted and the walls whitewashed, and Olenka, arms akimbo, was going about the yard superintending. Her face brightened with her old smile. Her whole being revived and freshened, as though she had awakened from a long sleep. The veterinarian's wife and child arrived. She was a thin, plain woman, with a crabbed expression. The boy Sasha, small for his ten years of age, was a chubby child, 
with clear blue eyes and dimples in his cheeks. He made for the kitten the instant he entered the yard, and the place rang with his happy laughter. Is that your cat, auntie? he asked Olenka. When she has little kitties, please give me one. Mama is awfully afraid of mice. Olenka chatted with him, gave him tea, and there was a sudden warmth in her bosom and a soft gripping at her heart, as though the boy were her own son. In the evening, when he sat in the dining room studying his lessons, she looked at him tenderly and whispered to herself, My darling, my pretty. You are such a clever child, so good to look at. An island is a tract of land entirely surrounded by water, he recited. An island is a tract of land, she repeated the first idea asseverated with conviction after so many years of silence and mental emptiness. She now had her opinions, and at supper discussed with Sasha's parents how difficult the studies had become for the children at the gymnasium, but how, after all, a classical education was better than a commercial course, because when you graduated from the gymnasium then the road was open to you for any career at all. If you chose to, you could become a doctor, or, if you wanted to, you could become an engineer. Sasha began to go to the gymnasium. His mother left on a visit to her sister in Kharkov and never came back. The father was away every day inspecting cattle, and sometimes was gone three whole days at a time, so that Sasha, it seemed to Olenka, was utterly abandoned, was treated as if he were quite superfluous, and must be dying of hunger. So she transferred him into the wing along with herself and fixed up a little room for him there. Every morning Olenka would come into his room and find him sound asleep with his hand tucked under his cheek, so quiet that he seemed not to be breathing. What a shame to have to wake him, she thought. Sashenka, she said sorrowingly, get up, darling. It's time to go to the gymnasium. He got up, dressed, said his prayers, then sat down to drink tea. He drank three glasses of tea, ate two large cracknels and half a buttered roll. The sleep was not yet out of him, so he was a little cross. You don't know your fable as you should, Sashenka, said Olenka, looking at him as though he were departing on a long journey. What a lot of trouble you are. You must try hard and learn, dear, and mind your teachers. Oh, let me alone, please, said Sasha. Then he went down the street to the gymnasium, a little fellow wearing a large cap and carrying a satchel on his back. Olenka followed him noiselessly. Sashenka, she called. He looked round and she shoved a date or a caramel into his hand. When he reached the street of the gymnasium, he turned around and said, ashamed of being followed by a tall, stout woman, you had better go home, aunt. I can go the rest of the way myself. She stopped and stared after him until he had disappeared into the school entrance. Oh, how she loved him. Not one of her other ties had been so deep. Never before had she given herself so completely, so disinterestedly, so cheerfully as now that her maternal instincts were all aroused. For this boy, who was not hers, for the dimples in his cheeks and for his big cap, she would have given her life, given it with joy and with tears of rapture. Why? Ah, indeed, why? When she had seen Sasha off to the gymnasium, she returned home quietly, content, serene, overflowing with love. Her face, which had grown younger in the last half year, smiled and beamed. People who met her were pleased as they looked at her. How are you, Olga Semyonovna, darling? How are you getting on, darling? The gymnasium course is very hard nowadays, she told at the market. It's no joke. Yesterday the first class had a fable to learn by heart, a Latin translation, and a problem. How is a little fellow to do all that? And she spoke of the teacher and the lessons in the textbooks, repeating exactly what Sasha said about them. At three o'clock they had dinner. In the evening they prepared the lessons together, and Olenka wept with Sasha over the difficulties. When she put him to bed, she lingered a long time making the sign of the cross over him and muttering a prayer. And when she lay in bed, she dreamed of the faraway, 
misty future when Sasha would finish his studies and become a doctor or an engineer, have a large house of his own, with horses and a carriage, marry and have children. She would fall asleep still thinking of the same things, and tears would roll down her cheeks from her closed eyes. And the black cat would lie at her side purring, Umarar, Umarar, Umar. Suddenly there was a loud knocking at the gate. Olenka woke up breathless with fright, her heart beating violently. Half a minute later there was another knock. A telegram from Kharkov, she thought, her whole body in a tremble. His mother wants Sasha to come to her in Kharkov. Oh, great God! She was in despair. Her head, her feet, her hands turned cold. There was no unhappier creature in the world, she felt. But another minute passed, she heard voices. It was the veterinarian coming home from the club. Thank God, she thought. The load gradually fell from her heart, she was at ease again. And she went back to bed, thinking of Sasha who lay fast asleep in the next room and sometimes cried out in his sleep, I'll give it to you. Get away. Quit your scrapping. The end. Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.